Well, hello again, back to the main stage for the second of our local CEO interviews. With us this time is Totnes-based CEO Andy Doyle from oh, yeah. Filmily. So um, we have had uh, quite a day today. I've been over on track to watch a lot of talks and there's been such a variety of things and I've been able to see a few bits here and there on the other tracks. Um, and talking about access from here in our virtual studio, obviously we really miss having the physical events and being able to see and be with you all um, and have that energy and interaction of an in-person event. But we are so grateful, obviously, to have all of these online services that we can use to enable you to access these events and us to access the audience. And Andy here from Filmly knows a lot about that. Um, the pandemic obviously put huge restrictions on everyone and the events industry was very hard hit, especially, um, you know, sports and that that opportunity for fans to go and cheer on their favorite team with all their friends with people that they might otherwise not meet and have that that energy and engagement and filmily uh, as a fan engagement platform you know i've been working with andy uh, as an advisor for a while and i sort of was worried about oh what's going to happen to filmily this early company looking at sort of making live videos of people at events and then i gave andy a call and he told me the most amazing story <laughs> of the big sort of pivot i know you hate the word andy like the pivot word, yeah. but uh, that is what happened. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to not say too much about it and pass over. And Andy, can you tell uh, tell the audience a bit about what Filmily were doing before the pandemic and then how that's changed in the wake of all the social restrictions? Yeah, okay. So before the pandemic, the premise was fans were going to stadiums, sport venues or music venues or anything like that. And their journey there, their time there, their journey afterwards, the idea was to enhance sort of get them to record their exciting moments. And then using AI, we take all those recordings and automatically make branded films for the, for the rights owners to sort of put out on social media to say, hey, look at our event, look at how the fans are loving it. Just to get that the fans feeling more part of it when they're there. Obviously, after three years of building it and launching in February properly last year, the pandemic kicked in in March. Um, so we very, very quickly, we chatted, we went out to some clients and said, you know, what is the problem we're going to need to solve for you, what can we do? And we very quickly turned around and added in features to build sort of mosaic videos, video walls for the stadiums, um, to, so fans can appear on the screens in stadiums. We built content for each and every fan who is watching remotely, so they have stuff from home to share on social media and to share with their fans, and just creating sort of memori memorials, what's the wrong word, memories, um, for fans you know, just to remember that they were watching an event, even if it was on TV. So, so you know, the pivot word is, is fine, but, it, you know, we've enhanced the platform now to have sort of a number of other versions of content we can do. I thought it was really interesting the way you sort of moved from, from that idea that the audience who's in the stadium records things and that then can be shared either on the screens or, or as promotional material for the mm -hmm. company and then moving towards actually the stadiums are empty and how do you give the sports people and, and people there that experience? So I know you did some work with some of the big sports events yeah. over the over the summer and, and I know most recently the Paralympics. Yeah, the Olympics and Paralympics, yeah. And so, given we're talking about accessibility and access mm -hmm. here today, were there any particular accessibility considerations for, for the Paralympics that were different to maybe the other sporting events? Yeah, I mean, the original premise for Filmly from a fan perspective was that it was integrated in existing apps. Um, but for the Paralympics, it was all web-based because of, you know, it's an established technology for all sorts of screen readers and alt text and yada yada. So, we built a... And it's only just possible in the last 12 months a sort of a whole library of our web-based, our app-based version for the web. Um, you know, the platforms and the browsers can only now just sort of support all the sensor data we record, all the camera modes and everything. So, you know, the timing was quite well. And I mean, we're probably one of the first to use all of that data via a browser on a phone. So, And have you yeah. had any highlights of particular sort of events you've gotten involved with over the past past year? Um, I mean, for me, the most exciting event um, was just a, over a year ago, was in August in New York, was the tennis. Um, so that was the US Tennis US Open? US Tennis Open, yeah, because that was the first really big one we did during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, we had content from 130 countries, 
Um, we processed 36,000 videos in the, in the time the tournament was on and sent out over 9,000 individual personalized films to fans. So, you know, it was a real sort of tick in the box that was scalable, the platform works and people want to use it. So. And so what did that, that was shown in the stadiums as well for the yeah. sports people? What did they get to see? So in, in the stadium in New York, the Arthur Ashe court is like the center court at Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. And, uh, on the screens behind, you know, when the players are sort of at the end of a game and sit down for a second or swap ends, um, it, fans, sort of mosaics of fans, but targeted to the player. So if they were from a certain part of America, all the fans from that bit would be put in a mosaic on the screen behind them. So it's like-minded people, um, you know, or if it was Serena Williams, we'd focus on, you know, female fans, you know, in her age range. So it all sort of looks relevant to whoever you're seeing. So there was a lot of sort of underlying sort of data an AI going on to create these sort of fan-based content. So that must be something that'll be really great even when we get back to all the sort of, back to some sort of normal where we're back in the stadiums. For all those people, you know, there's a limited number of seats you can sell, yeah. especially for your Wimbledons and the like. And that must be a great way for especially access for people without without the money to buy the sort yeah. of big tickets to get involved and to, for, you know, the sports stars to see exactly how far they're reaching with their audience. I mean, this is the journey of a startup, isn't it? So, you know, we had this premise and we stuck to it and then we sort of pivoted. And, uh, you know, and then we find out detail. You know, we were chatting to Real Madrid um, a month or two ago. We were in discussions with them. And within their stadium and the area around them, they have about 200,000 who can actively buy tickets and go to the ground, you know, on a reasonably regular basis. But they've got 480 million fans worldwide who will never go there. So... You know, the, the, the individual fan going to a stadium is technically more valuable, but the, the mass of fans who don't is infinitely more valuable and the sponsors want to attract those fans. So it was, it was a great learning curve and actually a great outcome for us in the end. So, so um, you know, we've been talking about access and one of the things thinking about is, is you're a local business to, yeah. to the southwest. And I think having worked with startups lot around here, that one of the big challenges is access to finance, to grow yeah. businesses. So you've got, I think, five businesses live at the yeah. moment, and you've yeah. founded more than that in your history. But do you have any advice you can share for other people in that situation about accessing support and finance? Um, I mean, I think the first bit is get involved with all of the programs and the government programs in the area. Um, you know, there's, you know, Tech Nation, you know, Tech Southwest, um, there's loads of them. Just Tech Exeter. Tech Exeter. <laughs> I was just looking there, going, yeah. Uh, but all these programs, they sort of open some doors and you have to do a lot of presentations and it's the tenacity of keeping on doing it and keeping on refining it to get people to sort of take you a bit seriously. And then the other thing for me is really, you know, we all try and say, we've got this startup and we do all these things. And then you really need to go, actually, we, we're a startup and the thing is we're focused on one thing and we're focused on it really well and find investors who are interested in that thing because you talk the same language. And um, so have you found there were particular routes of sort of finance that worked well for you? Obviously, there's grants, there's sort of angel investors, yeah. there's venture capital investors. So we've gone through all three of those. Um, we kicked off the company with an Innovate UK grant. Um, it was a long process and took up a lot of time, um, but that was the bit, you know, especially with the match funding, that sort of gave people the confidence. You know, the SEIS scheme and EIS schemes really give sort of angel investors confidence because their money is relatively safe. And so um, that's where they get a, a sort of tax relief by yeah. investing in a, a startup. Yeah, so you get sort of between, you know, 40% and 60% back if the startup fails within three years. Um, and things like that. So uh, those schemes, and you have to register your startup to be sort of compliant. So there's a learning curve there. If you don't know about that as a startup, you need to think about that. And then for us, really, it was, you know, we'd gone through a couple of angel rounds, and we're still sort of just angel round moving into the next. But the investment we got from a VC in the US, which, again, it was all done remote via Zoom because of the pandemic, um, that sort of puts the stake in the ground. Then, you know, once you've got your first even if it's a smaller amount from a VC, you know, that's everybody taking you seriously. And you as a business, you've got to sort of, you know, you have a lot sort of, of things to abide by because, you know, VCs, you know, want to make sure you're doing everything correct and they're, they're part of your sort of, you know, board then. 
So um, just a quick note to the audience, if you have any questions you want me to put to Andy, then then drop them in. Otherwise, um, my, my sort of last question I had before was... Um, it's about accessing talent. So another thing that, that can be quite tricky down in the southwest is, is getting access to tech talent. Um, I know you've got a very progressive approach to your working structures and your team. Um, maybe if you could tell us a bit about how you find talent and do you think and what you do and the way things work in your company and do you think that helps attract and keep talent? Yeah, I mean, the first thing, so for us, for a long time, we've had remote working, um, we've had flexible hours, and then that, for over 10 years, we've had that. Then we introduced unlimited holidays, just all done on trust. Um, and it's amazing. It really works. And then more recently, we've moved everyone to a four-day week. Um, so half the team have a Friday off and half the team have a Monday off because the key is the three-day weekend. So we don't have flexibility of we'll move it to a Wednesday or something. So it's the three-day weekend is the key. So that all really helps in terms of the mindset of the staff, the mental well-being, and really put you out there. Um, then, but to get the talent, they've got to know about you. So, you know, we contact universities locally, you know, Plymouth and Exeter. Um, and, you know, we network and we put adverts out. Um, but the key really is, you know, if I write a job spec, I'm going to write it from a middle-aged white male perspective and it's going to attract middle-aged white males. So the key really is then is to go out and find people who are experts in writing stuff for diversity. Um, so you can get people of all creeds, all colours, all sexes, whatever, to come and actually really want to work with you rather than the classic software company, which is all white males. So how have you gone about finding those people to help with that? Is that sort of consultants? Is that um, there's specific a, individuals you've, you've uh, A lot out? of Google search searching. Um, I'm involved in a few sort of networking groups and I've been in, put in touch with people. There is a growing talent of people who are becoming experts in it. But, you know, at the simplest form, you know, if you know a female who's talented or, you know, someone from a, another sort of culture who's talented and you can say, can you read this, does it, or can you rewrite this for me? And you bring it all together. I mean, there's simple ways to doing it and then there's obviously the consultancy route. So, you know, if I write it and I gave it to you, you'd probably go, well, I'm not interested in that and that. What about this? And then together you make it right. And there are some simple tools out there actually yeah. online for um, there is. language checkers. Yeah. I often yeah. run, run roles through that. They can be a little bit uh, off, especially when you put data roles through and they yeah. highlight data as a male term. So uh, you have to sort of take them with a pinch of salt. But there are a lot of useful tools out there. Um, I know I've seen companies who sort of try to hire developers where they've had an uptick of 30% more women applying yeah. just from, from doing this kind of work. Exactly, of, and that's... And that's going to get you more talent and make your company more interesting and just a better place to work, isn't it? So. And so we're almost out of time. So just to, to round up, I guess, Andy, what would be maybe some advice you would give to, you know, you, you've made a good success of, of Filmily and your other businesses. What advice would you give to other startup founders in the region to kind of access, access the markets and grow their business? Um, just really hone in your offering and just think, what is the single most thing I'm going to do best? And what pain and what problem am I going to solve for a client? You know, and do the whole SWOT analysis or, you know, all the sort of tools you've got out there. But it really is, don't try and be everything to everyone. Just, you know, if you're, I don't know, if you were a wedding photographer, you know, what type of wedding is it? Where would that wedding be? Who would you focus on at that wedding? Rather than, oh, I can do any wedding in fields, in churches, in blah, 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 blah. You know, even on any field, just narrowing it down and focusing on that. Once you get some traction with that, then you can start to widen it again. But, you know, for us, we've got lots of vertical markets, but we've focused on sport and really stadium sport. You know, so even sport was too general. So sport, outdoor stadium sport first. And then once we've, now we've got traction with that, we can start looking into other things. And off into the wedding market. <laughs> wedding market, we're just launching music. So yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot going on. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining Thanks, us, Catherine. Andy. Um, um, I'll hand over to our, the people who do it best at, <laughs> <laughs> at hosting the conference. Um, we'll have a very quick switch over and then it's time for the closing ceremony.